you laid it out. This is not reform they're talking about. No, this is an effort to uh, cut taxes, principally to cut taxes on business in ways that will benefit a small part of the uh, population and will do very little, in my judgment, uh, for the economy. Look, David, capital costs, if you look at the level of interest rates, if you look at price earnings ratios, they are lower than they've ever been. Uh, capital costs are not what's holding back uh, business investment uh, in uh, this economy. And so a huge expenditure, a huge allocation of resources to cutting business taxes, which are at half the level they were in the 1960s when the economy grew much faster, really shouldn't be our priority. Now, Larry, one of the things that Gary Cohn always emphasizes is the competitiveness between the United States and other countries. That one of the problems with our tax code is that we actually have a disincentive for companies to invest here, to hire here, to make things here. Is, is that a strong argument for you? I don't think so. Uh, ultimately, taxes are about, and competitiveness is about the total tax you pay, not the stated tax rate. And there, the United States is pretty much in the middle of industrial countries. There are things we should do to uh, level the playing field with respect to profits that are earned abroad and uh, kept abroad and profits that are brought back to the United States. But the great danger here is that we're going to have some kind of giveaway that is going to impoverish the public sector with respect to huge challenges that it faces down the road. Now, now Larry, you've said in the past, including on our program, that you think genuine tax reform would really be stimulative. It would cause growth to re-engage in the United States. What's different about what they're pursuing from what would really give us genuine growth? Genuine uh, tax reform that substantially uh, simplified uh, the code that increased incentives for uh, investment in uh, equipment. I think that could, that uh, encouraged bringing back in a permanent way large amounts of cash from abroad. That could have meaningful benefit for uh, the economy. But I don't see that developing in the proposals that are under discussion. And I think there's a risk that some of the proposals, like the emphasis on territorial taxation without a global minimum, would operate primarily to encourage more businesses to do more things abroad rather than in the United States. Real tax reform would concentrate on the various practices, whether it's earnings stripping or transfer pricing, that enable companies to avoid taxes by locating profits uh, abroad, and in particular in uh, tax havens. That's where we should be cooperating with our uh, trading partners so that mobile companies can't pit one country against another. This is, when, the, when you're in a race to the bottom, the right thing to do is to try to change the rules. The Trump strategy is to say we're in a race to the bottom and then try to win. So, Larry, can I infer then that you think the third, the second quarter GDP of 3% is A, not good enough, and B, not sustainable? Because 3% is pretty good. Sure. And everybody, know, everybody serious knows that uh, policy determines uh, GDP with lags of six months to a year. So nothing that's happening is sensibly yet attributable to the actions that are taken uh, by, the by the Trump administration. I was careful to say uh, throughout that I was not predicting, as some who don't like the president's policies were, that we would go rapidly into uh, recession uh, this year. So I don't think that that GDP growth figure is any kind of referendum on the president's uh, policies. I think a lot of it has to do with catch up from a very slow first quarter uh, for a variety of technical reasons and that there's nothing in the data that is suggesting to any serious observer 
that 3% growth on a sustained basis is in the cards over the next five to 10 years. Uh, Larry, going back to the 1986 tax reform, as you pointed out in your blog post, actually corporate taxes were increased, but taxes on individuals were reduced. To what extent would it really accomplish the growth objectives if in fact we focus on personal taxation? I think depending on what you did, there are things you could do with uh, personal taxation that would uh, encourage growth. For example, right now we subsidize people going into financial engineering through the carried interest uh, loophole. If we were to get rid of that loophole, we would have more people thinking about how to make better products, how to make more productive uh, workers, and fewer people thinking about how to leverage up companies. So there are things to be done on the personal side that would make the economy more efficient. But uh, there are limits. I think the most important thing is doing something about the global uh, system, but doing it in a way that doesn't involve winning, trying to win the race to the bottom, but tries to work with other nations to make sure there isn't a race to the bottom and that uh, businesses pay their fair share. So, Larry, I spoke with Gary Cohn on Friday, and I asked him about uh, why the job market is holding up so well, but wage and inflation are not keeping up. And he tied that to tax reform. This is what he had to say. Wage inflation has to come through demand for more workers at higher price. And the way we create demand for workers is we create a better operating environment in the United States. You create a better operating environment in the United States by making the United States more competitive. You create the competition by lowering the business tax rate and having businesses have to be here and want to be here. Now, Larry, you wrote in a Washington Post op-ed that in an era when the most valuable companies are the Apples and the Amazons rather than the General Motors and the General Electrics, the role of unions cannot go back to being what it was. Any leader concerned with the American middle class needs to consider that the basic function of unions balancing the power of employers and employees is as important to our economy as it has been. So am I setting up a debate here between unions versus tax reform as being responsible for wage growth? Look, here's the problem with uh, Gary Cohn's uh, argument. Uh, when you cut tax rates, it's true that firms get to keep more of their profits, but it's also true that firms get to deduct less of their labor costs. And when you're hiring somebody, those two things exactly uh, cancel out. Whatever maximizes two-thirds of your profits, the say after t which is what you get after tax, the same thing will maximize 75 percent of your profits if that's what you get after tax. So the problem is that he's ignoring one side of the equation, which is the deductibility of uh, labor tax of uh, of labor taxes. Yeah, look, uh, there are limits on what unions can do given the structure of our economy. But why should, at a time when inequality has increased so much, why should uh, our labor law be written in a way that enables firms to fire union organizers with impunity and either face no penalty or face a slap in the wrist five years later? Yeah, These are things that are easy to change. We can find new ways of organizing so that people who participate in uh, the gig economy have a chance to uh, be, treated f be treated fairly. On Labor Day, what we should be thinking about, all of us, whether we've got progressive solutions or whether we've got conservative uh, solutions, is that when S&P profits last year rise by 16 percent and wages rise by 2.5 percent, something's wrong. And people are going to get angry about that, and their anger is going to manifest itself in ways that are probably not helpful uh, to the economy. Yeah, Larry, I suspect that very few people will try to defend taking retribution against union organizers. But if we go back in history, as a practical matter, when you had the UAW with the auto workers, that worked for many, many years, and then it didn't work. We had right to work states in the South, and increasingly, actually, foreign companies taking over those jobs. So employers didn't just say, fine, we'll pay more for you as union workers, we'll find somebody else to do it. Why, in this new economy, the way it's structured now, could unions still work? 
First of all, first of all, David, you know, more than half the economy, more than half the workers in the economy are in uh, goods that are produced for local production. So you don't have that kind of globalization concern that you describe. Second, lots of employers are finding that high road strategies where they pay well, invest in low turnover, invest in training uh, their workers, invest in having high morale for their workers, actually turn out in the end to be lower cost uh, strategies than low road uh, subcontract and decentralize uh, everything. When I was president of Harvard, we did something that I thought was very important and that I'd like to see more employers do. We had a set of labor practices that we thought were right in terms of basic wages, in terms of basic protections for our workers. And we required all those we subcontracted with uh, to follow those standards as well. There's no reason why our large companies couldn't take steps in that direction as well. And if they did, it would have a spreading impact uh, throughout the economy. Instead, too many um, shrink to being very small in terms of the number of direct jobs they, they provide, brag about the quality of those jobs, and then outsource everyone else to every other job to uh, employers uh, and other firms who don't feel a commitment to stakeholders, don't feel a commitment to treating workers well. Uh, Larry, in your blog post, um, you go farther than simply taking issue with Gary Cohn. I mean, people, reasonably intelligent people can disagree who are informed on things, but you actually say that he may be reaching so far as to damage his own credibility when he says some of the things he says about the tax plan and other things like that that he's been discussing. Are you genuinely concerned that he could be undermining his credibility and therefore perhaps undermining his chances of becoming a chairman of the Fed? You know, on pers David, on uh, on personnel, that's the president's responsibility. I'm not going to say I'm not going to say any more about that. I can only speak for myself and uh, what I learned working closely with uh, Bob Rubin, and that w is that when you're a senior economic official, your credibility is important for you, but it's even more important uh, for the country because there will come times in real problems, moments of distress, when you're going to have to provide words of reassurance, deeds of reassurance, and your credibility is going to be very important. And so when you make misstatements, like erroneous statements, like the statement that Cohn made uh, suggesting that this was the first time in 31 years we'd have tax cuts, suggesting that this is somehow comparable, what, what he's doing now is somehow comparable to uh, 1986. When you suggest that corporate tax cuts have as their primary beneficiaries middle class workers, when it's obviously corporate shareholders who are disproportionately in the top 1%, when you assert that banks are um, paying hundreds of billions of dollars in compliance costs, when the reality is that the total payroll of banks for everything, um, all the banking they do, is only a few hundred uh, billion dollars, yeah. I think at a certain point uh, there's a risk that people think that you say things because they're expedient to say rather than because they're true. And I think ultimately that has a cost in terms of economic policy and I think ultimately uh, a core problem our country has is a lack of trust in uh, public institutions. And when senior officials say things where they know better, and it's kind of obvious that that's what they're doing, and by the way, I, I mentioned, because it's my area of economics, uh, what NEC Director Cohn has said, but it is as nothing compared to the number of factual errors uh, and blatant misstatements the president uh, has made. Yeah, I think that dishonesty breeds distrust, and distrust is ultimately very costly for the kind of country we want to be.
Yeah, Larry, you said you didn't want to take a stand on Gary Cohn, but it kind of sounds like you did, that if he was the Fed chair, you would definitely not be supportive of him. No. Look, I, I, I think I wrote in the blog that he has um, extensive financial experience, and that's a very, very important attribute for many of the issues that the Fed uh, has to deal with. So I'm not going to get into uh, proposing or opposing possible candidates uh, for uh, the Fed. I would just urge everyone in government to recognize that their credibility is not just their own asset, but is the country's asset, and to think very carefully about protecting it when they feel an urge uh, to make a statement of self-justification or a statement uh, urging that a particular policy be adopted.